Good morning, my friends. Today we're studying the case for grace. It's going to be chapter five on the homeless. Very convicting lesson. I'm excited to chat with you about it. This is going to be more about like, let's sit around and have a cup of coffee and talk about what a big deal this is together and look at it in the word. So I'm looking forward to doing that with all of you this morning. I am actually starting a kind of relaunching a greeting card line. And so I wish that you would pray with me about that, but I wanted to show you a couple of them. This is um, the first four. They're very high quality cards. They're five by sevens. So you can frame them if you want to. And there are prayers on the back of them. It's not a fold over card. It's a front and back and it's a very thick paper. So anyway, it's an opportunity for you to send a prayer to somebody and then there on the card, they can pray that card for themselves. And at the bottom of the card, they find an opportunity to download prayers for peace in, um, at my website. So I'm working on that. I would love your prayer and love to hear if you would be interested in being a part of like a subscription for prayer greeting cards. So let me know in the comments. Good morning, Kathy. I'm so glad to have all of you here. And thank you, Latasha, for your hallelujah on the cards. All right. Well, let's kick this off with some prayer. Talk to the Father and then we'll get started. Father, we come to you in the name of of your blessed son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much and counting us so important to yourself that you sent your son who was perfect to die and carry the sins, our sins to the cross, all of the sins. You knew how much grace we needed, how much mercy we needed. And you knew that we couldn't rescue ourselves or ever please you on our own. And so you have chosen to love us in this profound way. And you have made us worthy by the blood of Jesus to stand before you today and pray to come boldly to our good Father. And so we're here today asking you for a revelation of grace, a revelation of your mercy, a revelation of how to be grace, how to be an agent of your grace here in this life, in the midst of all of the suffering and all of the chaos. We know that you have placed Jesus Christ on the inside of us and we are anointed to do what he was anointed to do. And so, Father, we come to hear you, to bind ourselves to you again in our souls and our spirits and our, with our will to do what you say is important to do and to understand who we are in you and to love others the way you love us and the way you love the other person in our life. So it's in Jesus name that we pray these things. Amen. Okay. Well, today we are studying chapter five of the case for grace. And this chapter is on the homeless. We are, um, this one is based in Las Vegas again, chapter five. And uh, chapter five, we're talking about Cody. Cody was a, oh, excuse me. Cody was a um, drug addict. He was born to a young mom who was 14, an older dad who uh, left, didn't stick around. And he doesn't go into much detail, but he suffered a lot of abuse and um, ended up being on drugs and becoming a criminal. And uh, his story is tragic until it's not. <laughs> it's, it's hard to read, but it's also so good because oftentimes we experience a homeless person and we don't know their story. We just see what we see in the present. And uh, to be honest with you, I lock my doors because that's what I was taught to do. Um, I've been attacked a few times in my life and I... Um, that's my reaction. I pray and I, you know, sometimes I'm brave and roll down my window and do something about it. But, um, 
but it's a struggle for me. I don't know. Let me know if it's a struggle for you to know what to do when you encounter a homeless person or um, a person who appears to be homeless. And these days, it's hard to tell if they are standing on the street to get money because they really are homeless or if that's just how they're making a living. So only the Holy Spirit can tell us that. Only the Holy Spirit can lead us in being um, who we are supposed to be, <laughs> who Jesus is in us poured out to the person in front of us who has crossed our path. And man, this, this true story of Cody is so convicting. Um, and I mentioned this to you before. My counselors told me that when someone's addicted, it's often, most often because there's not an outlet for their pain and they are trying to self-soothe their pain. And then the, the chemicals of the addiction plays a huge part of staying that way. And in Cody's story, we see that there was a cycle. He would um, dip down and be in a really bad place and then he'd pull himself out and even uh, put himself through nursing school and became an LPN and even ended up being um, a, a sitter for a lady who, an older lady who needed help in her home. And um, he just grew to really love her. Like it might've been the first experience of like genuine love that he, that he had. And, um, but he, when she passed away, he didn't have the resources he didn't know how to handle his grief. The habit in his mind was soothe myself with drugs. And so he plummeted again into this terrible place of homelessness and drug addiction. But the, the reality is the deeper he got, the more ready he was for God. And um, I'm just convicted that we we can't judge where somebody is and how ready they are for the gospel. So I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 25. We're going to read verses 31 through 46. Now in this before, this is Jesus talking. And before we get to this section of Matthew 25, Jesus is giving parables. And, uh, but this is not a parable. This is just Jesus saying, what it's like when he comes back. So um, this Matthew 25, 31 through 46, I'm reading from the New Living. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did I ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the internal, eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger. You didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. 
and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Y'all, this is heavy. <laughs> it feels heavy. It, it's, and it's so simple that what he's saying is at the very end, what will matter is what we did with the least. I can't hardly talk. This is what it comes down to. Not how you looked and not what church you went to and not um, how successful your business was or how many children you and grandchildren you had and what you gave them for Christmas or the vacations you took them on. Those things are great. And maybe those are your least. But he is making it very clear here that the people who are in need, that's who Jesus came to save. And we are those people. <laughs> we are those people that needed saving. We, I need the gospel. And the very hard things in my life that have caused me to feel the least in a group of people or um, have the least in certain circumstances, those are the things that have driven me to my knees and caused me to look up and ask for the thing that I can't do for myself or that the people around me can't do for me. And so glory to God for the people in my life who have been Jesus with skin on. And in Cody's story, we find this sweet middle-aged lady who walks up to him in a church and hugs him. Now, in this part of his life, he is so homeless that he hasn't had a bath in like three months, I think. And the homeless people were complaining about how bad he smelled. And so he was really low. And he found out about uh, this church. And it's actually Judd Wilhite's church. We studied Judd Wilhite a few chapters ago. He is the drug addict that became the preacher in Las Vegas. And so Judd Wilhite's church has a ministry for the homeless people that they can come in and take a shower on and have a bath and come to a service. And so Cody and one of his homeless friends got up at four o'clock one morning and walked seven miles to get to this church to have a bath and have a meal. And while he's there and before he's had a bath, this little lady walks up to him and says, sir, you look like you need a hug. And here he is so filthy. He doesn't want her to hug. He's afraid to hug her because he's, he doesn't feel worthy to be hugged. And, he, and he's been the object of such repulsion for so long. But she hugs him. She's like, I don't care that you, I don't smell you. I, you look like you need a hug. And she hugs him. And it was a turning point in his life. It was a spiritual act that he felt connected to love. He felt worthy of being hugged and touched. And, and he shares that what it's like to be a homeless person is it's, it's like being less than a dog. He said some people would actually try to run him over because he was homeless in the way he appeared. Um, again, so convicting. We don't know we don't know what's happening in their minds. We don't know what they've been through. You don't know what I've been through. I don't know what you've been through. We all need Jesus. So anyway, Cody's story goes from being that moment in this church to eventually getting a job and a place to live because of the connection with this church and Back in his story, he had been washing windows in a parking lot to make enough cash to buy the drugs that he needed. And one lady, um, he stopped one lady who was in, a, he remembered a red car and asked if she, he could wipe her windshield. And she said, no, I just had my car detailed, but I do have um, this $5 gift certificate for this hamburger place. And so that was just such a memorable moment that he got some real food. Later, she actually goes to this church where he has been hugged and welcomed, the welcome of the Lord in that woman's hug. And 
um, the welcome of the Lord when this woman rolls down her window and gives him a gift certificate to real food. That woman became his wife, the one that rolled down her window. What a testimony. And he became a preacher. And he is the volunteer leader of a homeless ministry where they house and feed homeless people, giving them a chance to experience the love of God. Now, the homeless person, the person in need, it's their responsibility to receive it. We are homeless in our eternity without Jesus. And when there's nothing that is going to remain except our spirits, everything we have around us, every person around us, we're all homeless without Jesus welcoming us into God's home. And Jesus went about in his ministry for those three years without a home. He just traveled and spoke. We don't hear about him building a house and having all the things. He, he gave up the life that could be in order to be Jesus to the least of these, in order to show and demonstrate the love of God to the least of these. And so how are we in this age <clears throat> where we can have so much, but what are we giving away of Jesus? How are we giving Jesus? We can have a lot and still give Jesus all day long. It's just a question to ask the Lord, how are we being Jesus <clears throat> with feet on, with skin on in this world to the least of these? Who are the least of these in my life and how am I? fulfilling the gospel in their life. If we've gone over Isaiah 61 over and over again, but when you marry it with Matthew 25 and we see in six, Isaiah 61, the ministry of Jesus to set the captives free, um, to take ashes and make beauty, to make people into someone who is a righteous as an oak, who wear the robe of righteousness. The Lord keeps telling me over and over again, my worth is in my salvation. It's in me being redeemed. It's in who my father is. It's in who I'm a co-heir in Christ with. It's, it's my connection to him. That is my worth. And the world has a lot to say about what makes us worthy. But if we don't stay in the gospel in these days, our love will grow cold. Our heart will be dim. Our eyes will be dim and we won't see the need. We won't do walk out um, the, the work of the Lord, what Jesus came to do. There's so much uh, to study in this, to know about it. But all we have to do is ask the Holy Spirit. One of the questions in the back of the book for this chapter is, what can one act of grace accomplish? That one hug, that one girl lady gave that very stinky homeless man had such a profound effect on his life. It was a turning point and, and how the Holy Spirit got him to the church. You know, like that had to be people praying for the ministry to be effective and praying for the lost and calling them in. But I just want you to, to, to ask the Lord some questions. Reread this, Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Look at this chapter and Cody's story and have hope that your hug, your $5 gift certificate uh, to a place to eat, to give to the homeless, your words, your smile, um, you're giving up more than 10% of your income for the gospel. What is it? What is the Lord asking you to do? What can you give today? What's in your hand? What, what time do you have? And, and just keep going back to Matthew 25 to see how important it is that at the end, when Jesus comes back, the division from the sheep and the goats is going to be about what we did for the least of these and that when we do that for the least of these we are doing it to Christ and how worthy should that make us 
that when we have received that kindness from Jesus through someone else, that we were the least that needed it. And he was pouring into us because he wanted to, because that's what his ministry is to us. And so at the feet of Jesus, we are simply as worthy as the next guy who needs Jesus and who receives Jesus. And for me, receiving Jesus, what I've needed from him may look different than what you've needed from him in the natural. But what we've needed is somebody to save us from ourselves and to save us from the things that are the evil. Um, we can overcome evil with good. That is what Jesus did. He didn't he didn't let the evil going on around him stop him. And he died in the process of redeeming us. And we get to die to ourselves. And there, there is a persecuted church. There's a documentary called The Insanity of God that I really hope you'll look into. It's um, put on by Lifeway. The title is shocking, The Insanity of God. But basically it addresses, is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth the sacrifices that we make? And um, this missionary and his wife, they go out and they do missions in these other third world countries and they end up giving up a lot to do it. One of their sons passed away in the process. And so there was so much grief in doing it. But eventually they took on this new role of going into these other countries and meeting with the missionaries and learning from the missionaries what it's like there in those persecuted where, where Christianity is so persecuted, what it's like to be a Christian there so that we can learn how to be strong in our faith as a persecuted church, because we live in this country where it has not been persecuted, but friends, we can look around and see that it's coming and we need to be strong. We need to have strength. Our love cannot grow cold. I want wanted to read to you Matthew 24. I hope I can find it. This is starting at verse 4. Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of war, and don't panic. Yet, Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. It's our job not to let our love grow cold. And the way to do that is to stay in the word, to stay in prayer, to build ourselves up on our most holy faith and to live like Jesus and forgive, forgive. He is nailed to the cross and he's forgiven the guy next to him who is an enemy of God. You and I have been enemies of God and, and we miss the mark all the time. And the people around us are missing the mark all the time. They just don't have Jesus and they're going to hate us as long as they don't have Jesus. But there's a chance they could have Jesus. Graham Cook calls them pre-Christians. You're, you're looking at a pre-Christian. And the Holy Spirit is with you to tell you to run, to lock your door if you need to, or to protect you with his angels as you minister to someone who doesn't look like you or act like you or, or think like you. It's a scary world if we let it, if we focus on the wrong things. And I do. I do. I, I get scared and I lose my footing if I'm not focused. Um, one of the ways the Lord's helping me focus and get out of the pit of my own thoughts and sorrow is to worship him and, and to stay 
uh, to keep his word in my mouth, coming out of my mouth, not just reading it, but I actually have to be active reading it, walking around reading it, getting on my knees reading it, walking around my room worshiping, dancing before the Lord, um, as active as I can possibly be, because with that movement, there's something in that for me. You may not be like that, but um, it is working for me. And so maybe you should try it if you need help in that area. But worship, just worship the Lord. And in worshiping Him, we will be lighter and freer to ha- to hear Him and to have His thoughts and to know who our least of these is. Maybe it's an adopted child. Maybe it is Um, money to help an orphanage. Maybe it is something, a way to help single moms. It doesn't have to be hard. It can be. It doesn't have to be all life encompassing, but it can be. But who are the least that God has for you? Just pray about it and ask him, what is what, what is the gesture you have for me in this moment? That, that one act of grace that you want to pour through me for someone else and just know that his when his mighty power is at work within you he can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or imagine just as happened for Cody with when one woman chose to embrace in a hug one very stinky homeless man because he needed it she just knew he needed it and she didn't care that she was going to possibly could get something, smell bad for the rest of the day. She just did it. There's, um, there are a lot of proverbs that can uh, speak to this. And one of them I wanted to share with you is Proverbs nineteen seventeen. Kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord and he will repay the lender. Kindness to the Lord is a loan to, kindness to the poor is, is a loan to the Lord. Think about that. You're a loaning to the Lord. Look how that lines up with Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord and he will repay you. So just rejoice that if when, when we give, it is given to us, pressed down, shaken together until it's running over. It's a promise. He is faithful to his promise. Then everything else may fall away, but his word will not. And when we give, we may give one thing and get something else in return. He, God knows what he wants to give us and he wants to give it to us. He knows what we, I mean, we just get to do the giving, the thing that's in front of us to give, knowing that he's going to come with what we need. He knows what we need. This season of my, this last few years of my life, I've had some significant needs and God has done something, so many wonderful things to meet it. And uh, the giving that people have done in my life has been so sweet and so unexpected. And um, it, it makes me thankful that I've been through something hard financially because I've gotten to see the gospel in a different way as it applies to me and not just be the person who is like, oh, let me help the poor because I am rich and they are poor. And it is because now I have been poor and I have needed and I've received and I can't stand it for somebody to feel like I felt and not get it. And so they're just there. God has ways for us to meet the needs and we have something in our hand. And the more we give, the more he's going to put in our hand to give because he's going to trust us with what we have stewarded and we will get to steward more. And let's just be so focused on what matters that today, what we do with today matters because When it comes down to that last day, when Jesus comes back to separate people and to bring us, bring his people into the fold, into heaven with him, it's what matters is what we did with the least of these. I love you. And I'm so thankful that you're here with me. And I am pray, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to lead us in this wonderful life of giving. 
giving of ourselves, giving of our smiles, giving of our hugs, giving of our homes, giving of our money, giving of our prayers, giving of our hope. Lord, I just thank you that all of it can be inspired by you. It doesn't have to be something we um, manufacture, but Lord, help us to step out into it, knowing you will meet us there. I thank you for Ephesians 3.20 that reminds us that it is your mighty power at work within us. And that other verse that says, it's not by might and not by power, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord. Help us to be led by your spirit in giving the way you have given to us. And let us just be our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, our own hearts, just be open and not callous, not cold, not hard because we've been hurt, but be healed in the process of giving. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your healing. Thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha. Thank you that you're the God who sees us, the God who is here with us. And help us to be Jesus who sees somebody else and who is willing to be with somebody else in their time of need. We thank you, Lord, for leading us in righteousness for your name's sake. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen, ladies. Thank you for being here. We'll see you again next week. Keep reading this book, man. It's life-changing. Even just small little nuggets of somebody else's story. And help let it remind you that your story matters. Your little story or big story, it matters. It's life-changing. I love you. Bye.